then this week, once and the toilet goes up. I have never ever seen that. And did I don't get mad, Mark? I'll say, hey, no, I understand. I and did I complain because you left it up? <laughs> did I? You didn't even know that until I said it right now, did you? You left it up. I want a little conference with you this afternoon. <laughs> All right. We have we have we've talked about a lot of things that just just set this off boom. Set this off boom and, and the crazy cycle will jump. And then we get into a no resolve situation. And the crazy cycle is just going like this, and it quickly jumps to well, I'm not showing her love, and I'm not showing him respect, I'm not showing her love. And it, and it just gets out of hand so fast. Well, in, in closing the last couple of weeks, we've got to put something in. And this is a man chosen word <laughs> to just put some positive things back in to re energize or energize whatever the need is, or to keep the energy. I think in a lot of your cases, it's keep the energy. Keep doing things that you're already doing that way. And so we want to talk about some things that are on a on a cycle called the energizing cycle. Now we're going to use two acrostics. And remember a few weeks ago I said, I wish it was an A, B, C, D, you know, this is how to have a happy marriage. Da, 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 da. Doesn't work that way. And the purpose for an acrostic is not to say, do these settings, everything doesn't work that way. You know that already without me saying it. The purpose of the acrostic is to help you remember. Help you remember. And, and the first one is the word couple, the second is the word chairs. So, a couple of chairs. I don't know what significance of that. But, a couple we want to start on today, and uh, if, we, if we hurry, we can maybe get these two that way. And, a uh, couple is one uh, is uh, things, things about your wife that you need to know, guys, so that you can stay in tune with her that way. And uh, chairs are things to know about your husband. Now, you've all been waiting for the S word. <laughs> all right? That does not stand for Superman or Superwoman. All right? The S word is in here. So you'll have to keep coming because I'm not sure which one. So you want to talk about the S word. All right? <laughs> Super sober. So I don't know what it is. That way. All right. But uh, I want you to take your Bible. And let's start on this little one about how we're gonna how we're gonna spell love to our wife. And I want you to go to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter two. This will be familiar with you again. And I like Karen's reinforcement when she said, "You know, you can take these simple verses and they apply to marriage. They apply to marriage." Genesis chapter two. Trying to get used to a different Bible and I'm very slow. I'm sorry, find your thing. And it's verse 24, and you have seen this many times. Therefore, a man shall leave his father. This is the really probably the first reference to marriage, direct reference to marriage in, in God's word. A man will leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, uh, hold fast to the wife. Anyone have a different word? Join. Join. Cleave. Cleave. Yeah. I like I like the old English word cleave. I don't use it in illustration here. Cleave. Cleave is uh, to just be so tight that it's inseparable. Now you all know what plywood is, right? Now, how do they make plywood? Well, they take very thin sheets of wood, and they use something even better than Gorilla Glue. I don't know what it is. It's tougher than. And they lay these sheets face to face, and you have cleaving. You have cleaving. And when they get done, you go in and you buy a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood. You don't go in and buy 4 by 8 by 1 30 seconds piece of wood. Roll it up or fold it and put it in your pocket. And what they going and, and the example is when God is bringing a man and a woman together in marriage, he is bringing them in to this solid, glued together, together, excuse me, and by his word, glued together forever, forever, and you can't take them apart. I, I went to a church, visited a church on a Wednesday evening once uh, back in the Midwest, and the pastor was doing a whole series on divorce. 
and he had two men carry out a piece of plywood, set it by him, and gave each of them a hammer and a wood chisel. And he started preaching. He said, uh, that's made of different layers. Will you please separate them for me? Here's your hammer, here's your chisel. Separate them into all the layers that went together. And he started preaching for 15 minutes. And these guys are on the platform pounding this, this plywood, trying to take it apart. And after 15 minutes, he stopped. And he said, how you doing? And of course, it was obvious how they were doing. You know, that that one corner of the sheet just beat to pieces and everything else. But the floor was covered with what? Chips. Chips, splinters, little pieces, and everything else. He said, when God brings two together, his illustration was perfect. When God brings two together and makes them one, that's inseparable. And when man tries to separate it, that's what you have. The best illustration of what that was was, and also, those are your kids laying down there. Those are your kids. So it's a great illustration. So when God, God starts out, the first thing he says about marriage is this, this cleaving, this joining together. Now, the, the first letter in the acrostic on... And uh, how to love your wife is to figure out that she and all other ladies are into closeness in the relationship. They want closeness. Uh, they want face-to-face. -face. Have you ever... Uh, well, let's take one other reference before I go that way. Go to Deuteronomy 24. Deuteronomy 24. Please. Thank you. And the verse will be 5, 24, verse 5. When a man is newly married, instruction to the Israelites. When a man is newly married, he shall not go out with the army or be liable for any other public duty. He shall be free at home, how long? One year. One year. To be happy. Happy with his wife whom he has taken. And so, you know, as God begins to talk about this and, and lays this out, this was the rule of thumb. You know, in Israel, they have always been part of the military. But their rule was, if a guy gets married the first year with the superior's blessings, he goes home to create the bond of closeness. That's how important it was. Now, we know that that is not going to work in our culture. Not only do we have one working in, in our culture nowadays for many, many different reasons, none of them necessarily bad, we have two working. And so, you know, you get married, <laughs> you're not going to get a year off with pay <laughs> to go home and to be happy. I, I like that in there, it's to be happy. The idea was to bond, but the result of bonding and cleaving is happy. Is happy. Okay? And so here we have this background and of creating this closeness. And ladies are made for closeness. They like face-to-face. -face. Go in Starbucks. Go in McDonald's. Got little round tables. And stools that do what? They face each other. They face each other. And who usually occupies them? Ladies. Ladies. All right, unless you take your wife out for a treat at McDonald's. That's a treat. That's a treat. Thank you. Isn't <laughs> somebody going to say something? Thanks, Patty. And that's a treat. Sometimes it is, but not very often. But there's a purpose in that. Not just that round tables will take up less room. Uh, the intimacy of conversation. Do you know how places cater to people to come in, spend their time, bring your computer? We got Wi-Fi, da 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 da. The whole bill wax, and, and they come in and, and they and they sit down and they go face to face. They go face to face. When women go face to face, they use what they're best at. They use their words. They communicate. They they have a happy occasion. Everything else. And when a man and his wife come in, they go. We watch, we watch couples, and some of you are couples. We watch couples. We were laughing the other day, and we were in, I can't even remember the place, they never said 
one word to each other. Not one word to each other. I mean, not even like, shut up. <laughs> they never said a word to each other. What is this? But, but a, a, a woman is in closeness, and men, whether you understand it, whether you like it or not, they are built that way, and it is a positive thing. It's not a negative, because when you learn to go face to face, face to face, face to face is good. In the next class, when we talk about parenting, we'll talk about those early conversations when you're training them that way, and uh, we will really strongly make the point of look me in the eye, look me in the eye. And, and if they don't look you in the eye, you take their little chin and you line it right up. And you bring it up close so there's nothing else to see but your eyes. Now when you look at a child like that, what do you look at? You can look at their soul, can't you? You can look at their heart. It's the same way. Guys, the gals want you to engage face to face. Eyeball to eyeball. And you better learn how to do it that way. Uh, they want to feel close. Emerson Egrich, in his book, used an illustration of how, how he learned that. He, he put his little girl to bed one night, and they would just, uh, you know, read a bedtime story and everything, and he turned out the lights and sat there for a few moments, and the girl wanted to tell him a story. It's pitch dark, and she started the story, and she stopped, and she said, Daddy, look at me. And he said, I am. He said, no, you look at me in the eyes. It's pitch dark. He said, First time I learned what a woman wanted. Look me in the eye. Look me in the eye. And so closeness is a closeness is a thing that we need to learn. If we are if we are truly going to love our wives right way, we have to love them the way God created them, and He created them for a close relationship. Now it's all benefits. It's all benefits that way. Now you begin to meet her emotional needs when you engage, when you connect, and you engage her eyeball to eyeball and have conversation, you will begin to meet her emotional needs. Now, should we say you can meet all the emotional needs of your of your lady in your life? No, that will never be possible. Okay, That will never be possible. But you work towards that goal of doing that in a particular way. And guys, to talk to your wife does not rob you of your masculinity. It might enhance it a little bit. You talk to your wife. And, and cultivate this thing of, uh, of closeness for her that way. So the first thing we want to see is, if we want to uh, engage our wives, is that we would develop closeness with her. Uh, Genesis 29, I want you to see another reference here. Genesis 29. Genesis 29. Genesis 29. This is Jacob and Leah and Rachel and that whole mess. One of the Bible's first dysfunctional family, but certainly not the only one uh, that way. And, and so Leah is uh, giving Jacob children right and left. And in uh, verse 34, she conceived again and bore a, son, bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Now, she was on the wrong path. No, she was on the right path, but she chose the wrong method. She was on the right path, but she wanted closeness. She wanted that close relationship with her husband. And the wrong path was she thought it was going to be by producing more and more and more and more ch children, and then she says, now he will be mine. Did it turn out that way? No, he never really loved her. You know the background of that whole story. He never really loved her. Uh, and she was just a means to an end of bringing all these kids in the world that way. But she desired closeness. She desired closeness. Ladies like that closeness. Now that closeness will create affection. Women create, or women are created for affection. When we get into parenting, we'll talk about little girls and their need for affection from a man, and the only man to satisfy that is their daddy. 
I will make a flat, bold statement. The best way to keep a teenage daughter from getting pregnant will be her relationship with her dad. Take it over. Thank you. Some of you actually listen to that. <laughs> Shook your head right. They are made for affection. They need affection. Your wife needs to be held. She needs to be hugged. She needs everything else. And the, and the problem with us guys is, here we go. We run to that one. This affection I'm talking about has nothing to do with the physical relationship. They need that close security of being held, being talked to, being understood, etc., etc., etc. When you when your children look at you and you're playing kissy face with your wife and they go, ah, you're on track. <laughs> you're on you're on track. Stay on it. And really, they don't mind it. Uh, you're a guest. You cannot. <laughs> Bad enough, your mother. I just want to backtrack for just a minute on something you said about um, your daughters getting pregnant and their relationship with their dad. Because during this time that their dad left my daughters and whatever, three out of four of them, three out of four unexpected, unplanned pregnancies, abandoned by their father. Hang in there, bud. We love you. <laughs> Mom will make you a pie this week. Yes, she will. <laughs> the real reason they had us come to live there because Buddy wanted those pies to be real close by. And those grandchildren are very blessed. God loves those grandchildren. It's a watch. <laughs> yeah, we didn't send any of them back. No, we did not. Okay, thanks, honey. But uh, affection. Uh, men, we need to learn so much more about affection. About affection. And, and it does involve touching. It does involve holding. It could be holding hands. Women love that. They identify with that. And they feel connected to you. And you need to feel connected to them that way. Mommy, what time is it? Do I have time for one more? I have a question. 10 o'clock. Go ahead, Joan. Do you think environmental plays into this too with the man? Or Go ahead. And how they grew up. You speak right up. Yes. Because I didn't grow up in a very affectionate family. So. Perfect point. Perfect point. And I and I have to digress. And and, and I love my family. I mean my extended because the illustration is extended. Is one of my sisters. Uh, one of one of my sisters lived over sixty years. Her husband deceased now. In a marriage where there was absolutely no <coughs> affection. <coughs> no affection. <coughs> so they had five children. And those children grew up with no understanding of affection. Knew how to holler at the kids. <laughs> Knew how to holler at each other. But no affection. That I'm so glad you brought that up. That way. Uh, this business of affection is, is so much bigger than than we think, and, and men, we struggle because we, we go off towards the tangent of sex all the time. Um, I, I realize in sex there is affection, but this is not what we're talking about. You know, we haven't got to S yet. <laughs> we're on A, affection, affection, closeness, closeness. Women crave that closeness. God made them that way, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Let's, yeah, go ahead, Dave. She mentioned uh, uh, environment. Uh, I'm ha blessed to work with a bunch of other guys who are believers, strong believers, and I'm also old enough, they like to remind me of that, that I'm having uh, kids of parents that I had before, and in a number of cases I've said, it's just like what I saw in the previous generation, and anyhow, one of my younger cohorts said, yeah, it's generational sin. And so not only is there environment, but also another thing that really plays into this is generational sin. I think that was a good, that's, that's good comment. Awesome, yeah. yeah. It, uh, it is interesting if you're in the teaching field very long to watch the kids of the previous kids come through school. You've got a little ways to go, Anna, for you. <laughs> Just a little bit. But to see children of the children. And you know, it's the old saying, the apple doesn't fall very far yeah. from the tree. Yeah. That's why Karen's so much like her mother. <laughs> yeah, she is like her mother. There, all four girls are like their mother. And that is a huge praise to the Lord. Oh dear, they were the other way. What time did you say it was, babe? Ten o'clock. 
1004, we better not start. But but here's where we're here's where we're going with this. Closeness. This is for husbands. Remember, we're gonna to get to the, the wives, what you do for husbands. And and wives, this is where you get nailed with the S word. Uh, so I'm sure your husbands will not be here on that day. You need to hear this. Uh, closeness and, and they're they don't just they just relate to each other, they flow. Oh, is openness, understanding, peacemaking, loyalty, and esteem. All of these things your wives must have, guys, and we'll take them apart with some scripture in the next few days. Karen, thanks for your words. Uh, you must realize that's not easy. Uh, last uh, last year, she spoke in Northern Colorado at the Women of the Word Conference. There were 200 women and Buddy and I there. <laughs> of course, we got a lot of attention, you know. Handsome guys coming in with all these women that way. But uh, she spoke about three hours. Buddy spoke for an hour. And their oldest daughter flew in from New Jersey. And, and uh, then you can hear the, the whole story. And it would go together. But thanks for sharing. And, and Buddy, thank you for what God's done in your house. Well, Buddy, uh, have you ever heard of Bethel Ministries? It's not huge, but it's a, a ministry here in town that is growing and everything. I know Dick and Dick. Diana from there, Bev and I, and it is still working with those who are incarcerated. Uh, that's right, isn't it? Or have been, or families that have been. Yeah, that way. Buddy has had unbelievable opportunities. You know, sometimes you go through awful messes in your life, and if you let God use them. Buddy has had unbelievable opportunities with men in the same boat, you know, that way. And God, God is using them. Uh, it's like the Old Testament, isn't it? They meant it, they meant it for, for bad, but God meant it for good. He could do that. Let's pray a minute. Father, I've uh, been a little scattered at times this morning on some things, but uh, yet every week you lay a little bit of meat in front of us that we could grab hold of. I pray for us men today, Father. We are we just think we're, we've been taught by our culture that it's, you got to be tough, you can't be soft, you can't be tender. That is not God's method. You can be strong, and you can be all of those things, but God, we need tenderness towards our wives and our children, our children's children and our children's children's children. And so God, just speak to our heart as men that, that, that we'll begin to understand our wives, that they, they crave, they thrive on, they need this closeness, this connection, uh, this affection, Physical affection, physical touching, etc., God, and, and conversations about anything and everything. God help us as men. Help us to, uh, we'll probably have to hurry a little in the next couple of weeks to get these things down, but they are things that, that need to be incorporated in our lives and in our marriages. Thank you for these people. God, in their faithfulness and being here, I pray that they can do that two more times and and we'll just give you praise and thanks. Be with us in the morning service, God, that your word will be preached in a way that will have great meaning to our life. For we walk out needy into a new week, not knowing what will come our way, but knowing, God, that we'll be your strength and your power. Thank you for your goodness to us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, people. Thank you.